All right. As you can see, this was originally put together by Jack Shepard. Jack Shepard was our former mayor of uh, Winona, and I think he was mayor for 24 years. He got all the information from Marjorie Lentz's two books. Um, I know the second one is over at the library. I personally like the first one. It's got better pictures. So it's not my information. It's Jack Shepard's and Marjorie's. And let's go to the first slide. There's the map. Now, looking at the map, the, the crooked line that you see on the left, uh, it's kind of a pinkish color. That's the original railroad track. And the original railroad track went to Clay Hill, which is right behind my house and Marjorie's house, uh, by, behind South Jefferson. The green line that you see is the current railroad track with the new trestle and the one that goes right through town. Uh, right smack in the middle going east and west is Mantua Avenue. And we have a really large one of these maps at the, the town, not at the town hall, at the train station. So you can find your own property on this if ever you want to do that. Now, originally, it was seven farms. So we want to think about what did they grow on the farms. And usually the kids will pop up and say, oh, they are growing corn and whatever. But it was really sweet potatoes. Uh, it was seven main farmers that were basically growing sweet potatoes. Isaac Stevenson had the largest patch that they bought from him. But I think another one of note is Nathaniel Chu. And Nathaniel Chu's house is still on Glassboro Road. And he was a tanner. A tanner tans cowhides into leather. Have you ever heard of Tan Yard Road? Oh, I'll bet there's a connection. Slide three. Here we have the Stone House Farm, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with or driven past or walked past. It was built in about 1773. Originally, it was an inn and a stagecoach stop. And it was on something called Old Ford Road. Now, as we all know, to ford the river means you're going to cross it. So what are we crossing? We're crossing <clears throat> Mantua Creek. Well, you're going to have to build a bridge. They made the bridge out of bark. Oh, my goodness. Bark Bridge Road crosses Mantua Creek at Old Ford Road. And where is it going? It's going to Glassboro. Oh, and what did they make in Glassboro? Glass. Correct. Now, in 1777, we have records that indicate that the colonial militia was drilling for practice in a field related to the Stonehouse Farm. Uh, they would have probably been used at the Battle of Red Bank over in National Park during the Revolutionary War. Number four. I know this isn't exactly a photograph of Mantua Creek, but the boat in the front is the type of boat that went up and down Mantua Creek. Mantua Creek was big. It was about 15 feet deep and many feet wide. This is a flat boat, and these flat boats could hold up to 50 tons of cargo. This uh, was in the 1850s, and the um, area where it was docked and where it was making these, building these boats, these flat boats, was over by Hayes, Hayes Field, over by Lyle Field on Hayes Road. And over there, right by the bridge into Mantua, uh, into, yeah, into Mantua, was a tomato cannery. And they were canning approximately 2,000 cans, 200,000 cans, with 100 workers. And it was built by Joseph Campbell. Oh, let's see. What was Mr. Campbell producing? Tomato soup. So he, he were the market for the tomatoes that they would float down the creek and get them to Camden in order to make the Campbell soup. Um, next picture, five. This is a picture basically of Hennessy's Landing. Hennessy's Landing is the bridge that goes right into Mantua downtown. And it was about 10 to 15 feet deep, as I said. The original bridge was built in 1870 to get over there. It had a dock. They were building boats. They were taking the sweet potatoes and fish and glass from Glassboro. 
and firewood into Philadelphia. There was also a lot of marl in the area, which was very good for fertilizing. So what did we get from Philadelphia? Household products, shoes, clothes, and especially we got manure. Now, why did we need manure? What the sweet potatoes use? Number six. This is right behind South Jefferson. It is on its way to Clay Hill. It was the original narrow gauge railroad. Uh, but the complaints were that the curve was too sharp, the hill was too steep, and in 1861, that was a big issue. So they moved the tracks over to where we have them now, downtown. Hey, uh, we have to note that's not narrow gauge. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, Cross it right out. Yep. Yeah. It's, it, it's light rail. That's probably where that came from. It's light rail. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Lou is going to chime in whenever needed, and I'm perfectly fine with that. Thank you. Number seven. One of the wood burning stoves. It was a steam engine on the West Jersey Railroad, and that becomes the dominant theme here the West Jersey Railroad. And as you can see, it was this one was about 1880. Number eight. Next. There's our new trestle. It was straighter and flatter, and it made the railroad much happier. They relocated the tracks in 1866, and this one, of course, had to be adjusted. And they are standard gauge tracks, which means they're the same size all the way across the country. Number nine. Mm, I hope everybody knows where that is. <clears throat> it was built in 1866. It's called the New Mantua Station. It was on the west side by the dance parking lot. Currently now, of course, you know it's over by the post office and it's a private home. But back in uh, as the circuit here for 1870, it was on the other side of Mantua Avenue. And we'll have a picture of that in just a minute. But this was the New Mantua Station. Number 10. And there it is. It's on the left. On the left of the track is the new Mantua station. Now, the first thing you should notice is there's two tracks. We no longer have two tracks. And of course, on the right side where our current station is, was a shed. Uh, the Civil War General William Sewell was one of the vice presidents of the West Jersey Railroad. And as we talked last month, William Allen thought it's a good idea to build a town because you're going to get business for the railroad. And the tanner liked the idea and the farmers liked the idea. They talked to the seven farmers to buy their land. And the whole idea of the town is to finance and get money and business for the railroad. And you'll see how this develops. Eleven. Let me just uh, interject. There's a siding there to the left a locomotive sitting behind the station so. yep and there's miss general sewell general sewell was born in ireland but he moved here obviously he fought in the battle of gettysburg he received a medal of honor at chancellorsville he eventually served in the united states senate in washington dc and of course the town of sewell is named after him and he was very important to the idea of building the town of Winona. 12. Last month, we had a talk about William Allen. He was a civil engineer for, again, the West Jersey Railroad. And he laid out the original streets. The Jefferson, Monroe, Clinton, Marion, Elm, Poplar, Cherry, Willow, Cedar, Mantua, East and West. And he has a plaque in D.C at the Union Station, as we noted, that he standardized the four U.S. time zones. 13? Uh, a little hard to see that one from this little thing here, but it's the meeting notes that these fellows sat down with the committee to create the town. This is from 1870, and it creates the Mantua Land and Improvement Company. And the committee to form this company in order to create the town was made up of Mr. Whitney, the Glass Whitney from Glassboro, 
George Wood, William Sewell, and William Allen. Next. This is a debate on what they're going to name the town. It was looking like we were going to be Rosedale, but then they changed it to Winona. And Winona is Hiawatha's mother, if you're familiar with the poem of Hiawatha. And she was evidently a very highly regarded Native American. 15. There we have the flag that we created of Hiawatha's mother. Next. Now here we have an advertisement. It's a flyer that the railroad was going to put out. And Winona was considered to be a summer resort. They were advertising boating and fishing and the healthiest air and water of any place. They were again trying to sell cottages and building lots. And you'll notice that the railroad train station, um, the times are on there. We're going to, when, uh, to Philadelphia and coming back from Philadelphia. Um, I believe it actually went to Camden and then you had a change in Camden. Uh, so again, the railroad was very important to the growth of the town. 17. Here's our very first building. The Winona House. It was built in 1872. There were 40 rooms. Again, it's basically a summer resort. It advertised that it had running water. And it's on South Clinton. It had gas lights. There were two parks. And you can see there's a major lane in between. The park was sort of split in half. And president in 1872. Hopefully, you know, it was President Grant. Uh, there were only 10 houses. There were six trains a day. And the very first 4th of July in 1872 had a 13-gun salute right in the morning. And they had fire sirens and they had balloon rides. They had croquet and bowling and fireworks. So it's not that different all the way back now. 18. William Morgan Building, we know it as Hawks, and in 1871, it was primarily a telephone office where you could make a phone call or receive a phone call. It was also a soda shop and a restaurant, and of course, we're in there now for the deli. 19. Now, this is Kitty Corner. This is where the cabinet shop is and the, the new hairdresser. Um, used to be the one-stop shop a while back, <laughs> the, yoga, the yoga place, and it was Benjamin Packer's store. This was 1872. Next. This is really nice when you see this picture uh, in the flesh because it's a nice panorama. If you go from left to right, you see the first railroad station, the New Mantua station. Then you see the Morgan building. In the back, a teeny little A-frame is the Presbyterian Chapel. Then you get to see the Monona House Hotel. Uh, Builderback is in there. And you can see the park. And this was the way over 145 years ago. So this is the beginning of the town. 21. This is the first school that we built in Winona. It's Noblitz Hall. It's still there. It's at 6 North Marion. It was built in 1878. Now, Dr. George Bailey proposed a school. For a while, in 1875, Charles Buckman hired a driver to take the Winona kids to the one-room school, Monongahela, which is where it is now. They had to go past Clark's Farm and Sally Bailey was the teacher at the Monongahela School. But then in 1876, George Bailey, who was Sally Bailey's brother, proposed let's build a school in Winona, right in town. And they had called this building at one time Daddy Howard's Hall, and Sally's salary was $360 a year. Woo! But then they hired Ella English at Moblitz, and she was getting $35 a month. And they had 55 students. 
and the neighbors had a complaint though about the Winona school. There was a big bell on top, kind of like the Liberty Bell, and it was a nuisance. They didn't like them ringing that school bell, so there were complaints and they removed the bell. Number 22. There's our boy, Dr. George Bailey. He was a physician. Uh, he was also in charge of Sunday schools. And besides being in charge of education for Winona students, he created the first United States and the Worldwide Sunday School Association. So he was very involved in the process of Sunday schools and our first elementary school. Dr. George Bailey also built the very first house in town, which is at 1 South Clinton, right at the corner of the park, and it was next to the Winona House Hotel. 23. Now we should all recognize that one, although you may not recognize the name. It was called the Sand Town School. I guess it was Sandy. In fact, they had a lot of cactuses and prickles and burrs, and a lot of the students had to bring scrapers to school in order to get the cactus and the prickles and the burrs off. So our sand town school was made of stone, as we all know, in 1894. 24. This is the Knott House. It was built in 1884. I'm sure we all know where it is. It was the second house built in town, and it's across from the former medical center. Um, it also had the same architect as a very famous building in Glassboro called Hollybush. And so there are a lot of characteristics that are very similar about the two. Now, Thomas Sinat was very involved in Glassboro, and therefore he's very involved with the glass business, and he was a generous person. 26. That's Mr. Sinat. His mother was Harriet Heston Whitney Sinat. Now, if you're familiar with the roads in Glassboro, Heston is a main drive. Uh, the Whitney family, again, is involved in the glass works at Glassboro, 26. And he donated the Memorial Presbyterian Church across the street from his home. Again, some of our early founders were quite generous. 27. Uh, this should look familiar too. Vicki lives there <laughs> as well as Lou. It's the Edward Farr home. It was called Little Grange. It's on Princeton and Mantua, of course. And notice the road is dirt, although it has a curb. And as you were discussing, according to Jack, that it was paved in 1925 on Mantua Avenue, but none of the other streets in town were paved. It's big because he had 11 children. Next. And this is Edward Farr. Uh, his family was involved in taking sails and turning them into oil cloth and then ultimately producing linoleum. And he was also the chairman of Cooper Hospital. And do you want to put anything else in there, Lou? He was another generous person, so let's go to 29. So on, on FAR, okay. um, so we went down to visit one of the 11 children in the early 90s, Wally FAR. He asked how dad's hospital was. And I'm thinking, huh, it's kind of a, yeah, what do you mean dad's hospital? It's kind of liberty. Years later, I bid on the audit for Cooper and I met the uh, chairman and the CFO in the boardroom. His bust is in the boardroom. His sayings are around the room. And then I got a book from Alfred Cooper written in 1944 as a whole chapter of him and how if it wasn't for him, Cooper Hospital never existed. The Coopers knew how they had tons of money from the ferry between Camden and, and Philadelphia from the 1600s. So they, they knew how to accumulate cash, but they didn't know how to start a hospital. So the building sat there empty for 10 years until Edward took the project on in his wife's first name in her honor um, to open up as a business. So, 
So we are Cooper Hospital centric here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 29. Mr. Farr donated the library in 1927. His mother was the founding member of the library and she lived in the Wyckoff house, the dentist house across the street. And as previously stated, some of our founding fathers were quite generous to the town. Number 30. Now that's an aerial view. And if you look, the one that looks like it's got three parts to the house right in the front center left, that's called the builder back home. And they demolished it to put up the library. That was the spot that Mrs. That Mr. Farr's mother wanted for the library. And this was a big house that they took down in order to put up the library. 31. I think we know this one too. This is the Comey home. The PZs live there now. And it was called Oakwood at the time, built by Robert and Teresa Comey in 1906. Mr. Farr showed Mr. Comey Winona. And then he was so impressed, he decided, I think I'll move here too. Mr. Comey dyed and bleached uh, fabrics in order to make hats. His land he called Camel's Back, and he bought it from Stephen Green. He planted a carload of shade trees for their deer park. This property used to have a park full of deer. And it also has something in the back, number 32. The tea house. Some of you have probably walked back there. Uh, many of their daughters had parties at what they called the boat house because there was a lake right there. The whole town was invited for concerts. There were um, stone bleachers, sort of. Uh, it could hold up to 200 people in the audience. And the most famous singer was Enrico Caruso. And we should all be at least familiar with Caruso, the opera singer. <coughs> 33. Oh, there's Dr. George Bailey's home. This was the first private home built uh, in Winona. It was next to the Winona House Hotel, one south Clinton, across from the library and the park. 34. Again, that's Dr. George Bailey of Sunday School and Elementary Fame. 35. That is Clark's store. Um, 3 Mantua Avenue. Built in 1880. They had hats boots, hardware, groceries, hay, etc. And here's the interior of Clark's store. No refrigeration, lots of bananas, I guess, <laughs> like that. Uh, they, you could go there to use the telephone, so that was a good thing. Um, I see the perambulator being pushed by the gentleman with the beard, and I have no idea who the guy in the picture frame is. But that's basically the interior. Now let's look at Clark's store today, 37. When this was taken, it was Mary Kay, the hairdresser, and now I believe it is a nail salon. 38. Stephen Green. Now things begin to change here with Stephen Green. Uh, he was a printer, inventor. He had patents and another generous person, as we'll see. He bought the Winona house. Cars were becoming in vogue and not as many people were coming out uh, on the train and they could go down to the shore and what have you. So it later became the Winona Inn and they added it from 40 rooms to 75 rooms. Eventually it becomes the Winona Military Academy. Now Mr. Green was the owner of Cedar Field. He also had peacock walks, greenhouses, and he lives at 207 South Clinton, 39. This is across from the Methodist Church. This is Stephen Green's home in 1886. And you can see it's quite large, number 40. However, his, they had a fire right in the middle section of his home, and they divided it into two houses. And, um, of course, they're still there today. 41. He donated, at least paid for, the Methodist Church and the Parsonage, another person who was generous to the town. 42. Uh, aerial view of Stephen Green's properties. 
as you can see, he owned an awful lot of the property in Winona. This is Cedar Field at the far end. Um, they say the grandstands, and you'll be seeing those in a minute, could hold almost up to 500 people. Uh, it's over there by the Maple Ridge Golf Course now, uh, which is something else. So he also had Japanese gardens, greenhouses, and his own sewer system. Number 43. This is the Winona Inn, the enlarged one. It's 75 rooms. The original Winona house was torn down, and this was considered to be much more modern. Number 44. And here we are at Cedar Field. Lots of activities. Then you can see the grandstands. Imagine three to 500 people could sit and watch an event. Uh, they, they had polo games, uh, bicycles, uh, running races. Um, and I'm sure they had baseball as well. And you're going to be seeing that in a minute. 45. Eventually, the hotel wasn't doing very well. The Great Depression is the problem, ultimately. Uh, and the Winona Military Academy is built in 1904. Uh, it's by the stone wall when you walk past the park. <clears throat> you can still see where it was as a plaque. The Winona Military Academy was for grades 6 to 12. Uh, again, Stephen Green bought the hotel and planned this academy. And it was considered comparable to West Point. It had classrooms, a dorm, a library, a chapel, and an infirmary. It was the social scene in town with dances, concerts, plays, a skating carnival, football, of course, horsemanship, and we had 200 cadets enrolled. 36. Here's the aerial view. You can see the drill hall. Um, it's a long rectangle to the right, center right. And center, center is the main hall where they had the uh, dormitories and uh, <clears throat> the classrooms. 47. It's a picture of one of the classes of the cadets. They had very specific uniforms depending on their rank. This was 1920. Uh, certain officers wore a sword. And the tall, tall hats with the feathers were called shakos. 48. This is Arthur J. Holton. He graduated in 1912. He was a World War I medic, and he died on a train coming home from World War I. He's buried in the Winona Cemetery, and as we were just informed, and I thank you, he is what uh, the American Legion Post, that's who he is named after. Um, and there's a house with their name on it, too, the Holton House. It might be Clinton. 49. This is the Academy main entrance. We do have the bell that they used to ring when you come in and you needed this assistance. Uh, I think Lou has that bell. He could find it somewhere for us. 50. There's the Cadet Dining Hall. 51. There's the Cadet Sleeping Quarters. This is the dorm. 52. This is the drill hall in the gymnasium. It's one of the largest gymnasiums in Jersey. Uh, it covered number 10 and number 12, South Marion at the corner of Cherry. 53. The interior of the drill hall, the gym. 54. Uh, the bowling alley and the shuffleboard courts were from the hotel and they converted those into science lab. 55. This is a cadet study hall, 56. Here we have the cadets marching on Ogden Road. Now, Ogden means Valley of Oaks in Sweden. So we know we're on Oak Valley as we're coming over towards Winona Lake, which as the sign says here, it was Warner's Lake at the time, 57. The cadets are on parade at the park. This was between World War I and World War II. 58. Again, drilling in the park between World War I and II. 59. Wow, 
the cadets had a trip to Washington, D.C. And in 1930, they met the president. And the president and his wife came out and greeted them as a class. Doesn't, can't do that now. Number 60. This is the first cadet football team. They did not use helmets. But notice what's hanging around the boys' necks in the front row. I'm going to show you what that is. To me, it's very unusual. Number 61. That is a nose protector. In order to not break your nose, they didn't have a helmet, but they had a nose protector. 62. Back at Cedar Field, we have horse racing. They had horsemanship from the Winona Military Academy. Uh, again, they had baseball, football, polo, tennis, and lots of activities at our Cedar Field. Number 63. Herb Pennock. He went to the Military Academy. He played on Cedar Field. He pitched for the Boston Red Sox against Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. He was in the World Series on the Yankees team. He was the Phillies general manager. And he's in the Hall of Fame at Cooperstown. And Herb Pennock played on Cedar Field. 64. Typical cadet graduating class from about 1915, I believe. Very formal uniforms. They have their swords. 65. This is the front view about the time that the military academy closed in 1935. As I'm sure you all know, 1935 was in the middle of the Great Depression and people couldn't afford any luxuries. Uh, but again, the wall that you see there is still there. So take a walk, and that's where the senior housing was. Number 65. Oh, the Winona Station. This one was built in 1893 and was recently restored under the direction of Jack Shepard. Uh, we saw it through wood, coal, steam, and electric. It was for passengers. It was for freight. It also took the high school kids, and they had a choice. The high school kids could either commute to Pittman High School or to Woodbury High School. Winona bought the train station in 1973 and then rehabilitated it and restored it. As was mentioned uh, this, when we first started, the train came through about every 15 minutes, between 5.30 in the morning and midnight. There were 61 to 64 trains every day. How often do you hear the train? Not that often. So let's review. The purpose of the town was to make money for the railroad. The seven farmers grew sweet potatoes. The town was originally a summer resort with the Winona House and the Winona Inn. It developed with the Military Academy and took commuters to Philadelphia. Basically, the town was all about the train. People were generous. They donated buildings. They had community activities. And people volunteered their times. And as I said, you can walk around town and you get to look at the plaques on the houses. I'd love to do that. And by all means, read Marjorie's books. They are full of funny, funny anecdotes and some really interesting pictures. And I know you can check out some of them at the library. So we thank you, Mr. Farr, Mr. Green, Mr. Allen, Mr. Sewell, Mr. Sinat, and Mr. Bailey. And I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Karen. My pleasure.